This is Ham College, episode 87, for March 31st, 2022. Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. Spring is on the air. Get outside with ICOM's ID52A. Hello, students. Welcome to another episode of Ham College. I'm Professor Thomas. And I'm Dean Martin. And we've got some splaining to do tonight, Tommy. What's our subject? Well, what was our subject last month? Do you remember that? Uh, I have a cheat sheet. I have notes written on my hand, like you (laughs) normally do in school. Semiconductor materials and devices. Semiconductor materials. I guess it was twice. Germanium, silicon, P-type, N-type, transistor types, NPN, PNP, junction, field effect transistors, enhancement mode, depletion mode, MOS, CMOS, N-channel, and P-channel. That was a a action-packed episode right there. (laughs) That was. And tonight, (laughs) we're going to talk about diodes. (laughs) Not diodinase, like, right? Diodes. Diodes, yes. Not diodinase or diodines. Okay. <laughs> if you want to pronounce it incorrectly. Like we did for years? Like we did for years. <laughs> I'm surprised. He's in, he made it to class, by the way. He just skirted in just under the bell. Yeah, he did. So we've marked you down for present this time, Emil. No, t- <laughs> no tardy. No, no, not tardy. Well, Cheap, but not tardy. True. <laughs> well, before we get into it, Tommy, what's what's it been like since the last show? Uh, stormy, and uh, the roller weather's been a roller coaster, literally. Yeah. And stormy and pollen. That's pretty much everything that's been going on in my place. That's about all we can handle. It's you know, just more than enough. In one month down here, it's yeah. we've had two major storms. The other night, a Wednesday storm blew through and knocked down several trees over near me off of Holy Road. Mm-hmm. Took our power out for a long time, man. Yeah, my echo link antenna out here is is just like this right now. Uh huh. Yeah, it's almost horizontal polarized. Yeah, I got to get out there this weekend and work on it. But, you know, it's hard. It's hard talking slant polarization. Uh Uh-huh. This is true. I got my uh, generator out, everything fired up first time the other night when the power went out, and uh, it worked great. (laughs) I got the extension cords. I plugged the last extension cord into the the generator to make power everything up, and the lights came on almost the same time. It was the craziest thing. Maybe you were backfeeding the neighborhood. Yeah. Well, we did that a week before. Yeah. Yeah, the week before, I I didn't have to put mine on here, but I had to put my mother's on. She lost power for like three days. They had tornadoes come through the town where she lived. So it was, yeah, did a lot of damage. Well, you want to get on into the questions? I, I know the answer to that, but I think we're going to have to anyway. Uh, well, let's just go for it. It's kind of yeah. like ripping off a Band-Aid. You got the buzzer all charged up? I do. Sitting yeah. right here and ready to go. And by the way, we want to welcome Andy back. He is, well, he's back from Poland. Poland? Poland, yeah. He's been volunteering over there, so we're we're glad uh Glad that he made it back here safely. Yeah, appreciate what you're doing, Andy. Yeah. All right, who's going to receive? 
I tell you what, I'll you tell received. you what I received this time because you seems like you. I've done do. it the last several times. Uh, okay, uh, you must have been looking over the questions before you said that. Ah, uh, uh, okay. I don't know which one's first. Like when I said the questions earlier, what is the most useful characteristic of a Zener diode? A, a constant current drop under conditions of varying voltage. B, a constant voltage drop under conditions of varying current. C, a negative resistance region. Or D, an internal capacitance that varies with the applied voltage. Hmm. What is the most useful characteristic of a Zener diode? Well, it doesn't, the capacitance doesn't change with the voltage on the Zener, so it's not D. A negative resistance region. I'm not even sure what that would be, but it's not that. So that means it's either going to be constant current drop under varying voltage or constant voltage under varying current conditions. So I know a zener is what you would use to like uh, clamp a voltage down. So I'm going to say it's be a constant voltage drop under conditions of varying current. Makes sense? Mm -hmm. When you put it like that, it does. Okay, well, let's see. And it is. And do you want some hand sanitizer? No, that's okay. okay. We're, we've only got about a uh, gallon and a half left. So. Yeah, you better spare some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so what do you mean by clamping voltage down? Well, so people might be wondering that. Maybe I should do some explaining about just exactly what a Zener diode is. That would be good. A Zener diode is a special type of diode designed to reliably allow current to flow backwards when a certain set reverse voltage, known as a Zener voltage, is reached. Zener diodes are widely used in electronic equipment of all kinds, and are one of the basic building blocks of electronic circuits that are used to generate low power, stabilized supply rails from a higher voltage, or to provide reference voltage for circuits, especially stabilized power supplies. They're also used in protection circuits against overvoltage, and especially electrostatic discharge. Hmm. Hmm. Pretty close, as you suspected. So... What I meant by clamping is if we took a Zener diode and hooked one side on ground and the other side on the positive rail of a of a DC supply, that uh, Zener is not going to conduct any current until we reach its voltage. If we're ramping up the voltage of the um, of the input, say we got a 12 volt Zener, it's not going to conduct anything until our voltage reaches 12 volts. As long as it's below, it's like it's invisible. But once we reach 12 volts, it's going to try to clamp it down right there and not let the voltage get any higher. Or it's going to start conducting at 12 volts. And the higher we go, the more it's going to try to hold that voltage down at 12 volts, depending on how you wire it in the circuit. Uh, so you can see, let's say, say you had 12 volt power supply, and you want to protect against, say, electrostatic discharge or, you know, something going wrong like that, you could put a Zener across there, maybe just a little bit higher than a 12-volt Zener, just to give you a little headroom. And if a surge or something came in real quick, that Zener would clamp it down uh, just to prevent it from going on to the gear. Hmm. That's interesting. So what what uh, different voltage ranges do they come in? Uh, almost everything. Just one volt oh. one volt increments. Uh, probably you can get them less than one volt. Oh, cool. Yeah, they there's a, a whole lot of them out there. I've never sat and looked at, you know, how many voltages they're available in, but uh, a heap. Interesting. Okay, well, I've got one for you. Okay. What is an important characteristic of a Schottky diode as compared to an ordinary silicon diode when used as a power supply rectifier? A. 
much higher reverse voltage breakdown. B, more constant reverse avalanche voltage. C, longer carrier retention time. Or D, less forward voltage drop. Ugh. What is an important characteristic of a shot key diode as compared to ordinary silicon diodes used as power supply rectifier? Okay, I'm going to go with D, less forward voltage drop, because that seems like a good characteristic of something to put in the power supply. Yeah. People in the chat room are saying it's D. I'm going to agree with you. Um, let's forward voltage drop. There you go. Ah. Off to a good start. Yeah. The night's still young. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Seems like I've heard that somewhere yeah. before. It's kind of catchy. So let's talk about Schottky diodes real quick here. A Schottky diode is also known as a Schottky barrier diode or a hot carrier diode. It's got a low forward voltage and very fast switching action. A cat whiskers detector like used in the early days of wireless and metal rectifiers used in early power applications can be considered primitive Schottky diodes. When sufficient forward voltage is applied, a current flows in the forward direction. A silicon PN diode has a typical forward voltage of about 600 to 700 millivolts. A Schottky's forward voltage is 150 to 450 millivolts, quite a bit less. The lower forward voltage requirement allows higher switching speeds and better system efficiency. Hmm, good reason to use a Schottky diode. That's the one you used to do a crystal radio with, isn't it? It is. A cat whisker was. Yeah, and I guess it could be considered a shot key, so yeah. What type of bias is required for an LED to emit light? A, reverse bias. B, forward bias. C, zero bias. Or D, inductive bias. What type of bias is required for an LED to emit light? Wouldn't be reverse bias. Well, that's kind of an easy one there. Yeah. I'm sure you sure that one wasn't mine. You're the one who wanted me to go first. <laughs> <laughs> it's not zero bias. I mean, that wouldn't get you anywhere, would it? And I'm not sure if there's such a thing as inductive bias, but a die or LED doesn't have that for sure. Yeah, I'm going to say it's B, forward bias. I don't concur with that. Yeah, and chat rooms concurring as well so i i think that's probably correct and it is forward bias you gotta you gotta bias the led in the right direction or you won't get any light out of it hook it up backwards nothing it's gonna be dark like a dark hole yep oh i guess this means we're gonna talk for a moment about leds it looks like we just may do that yeah a light-emitting diode, or an LED, is a semiconductor light source that emits light when current flows through it. The color of the light, this is interesting, corresponding to the energy of the photons, is determined by the energy required for electrons to cross the band gap of the semiconductor. White light is obtained by using multiple semiconductors or a layer of light-emitting phosphorus on a semiconductor device. The earliest LEDs, that would have been back in 1962, emitted low-intensity infrared light. I did not know that. Infrared LEDs are used commonly in remote-controlled circuits. The first visible LEDs were red, low-intensity, and I remember those. I think I probably still have some of that bag of 100 that I bought. <laughs> Early LEDs were often used as indicator lamps or in seven-segment displays. Recent LEDs are available in visible, ultraviolet, and infrared wavelengths with high, low, and intermediate light output. Yeah, you actually, you remember the uh, the little kits Thomas Witherspoon sent us? The, uh, yeah, with the jewel, the jewel Thief circuit. 
Yeah, it, yeah, it run off of a the AA mm -hmm. battery like Eternity. I used that for nightlight the other night when the uh, power was out. I was talking about. Yeah, probably with a dead battery. Uh huh. Yeah, I've still got mine over here, and the battery has been in it for several years. It. Uh, you better check and make sure it don't leak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it is a Duracell. Good point. What type of semiconductor device is designed for use? As a voltage control capacitor, A, a variactor diode, B, a tunnel diode, C, a silicon controlled rectifier, or D, a zener diode. Hmm. What type of semiconductor device is designed for use as a voltage controlled capacitor? Since you went through the, the uh, Zener diode stuff a while ago, I think I'm going to go with A, because I don't think that was in the explanation that you that you gave us. I'm going with A. All right. Um, chat room's a little mixed. Hmm. It is. Oh, a. I got it. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it was D. It although it seems. It almost could be, but the capacitor at the end of that didn't, I, I think that kind of eliminated it. Why would you want such? That's a real good question. Anybody got, anybody we know around here we know that can do some explaining? Well, just so happens, I was studying on this <laughs> subject like mm, last night. <laughs> And uh, a variactor diode, I don't have any pictures of one here, but it wouldn't be anything special to look at. It's a type of diode designed to exploit voltage-dependent capacitance of a reverse bias PN junction. That really says it all, doesn't it? It does. They're commonly used for voltage control oscillators, parametric amplifiers, and frequency multipliers. Voltage-controlled oscillators have many applications, such as frequency modulation for FM transmitters and phase-lock loops. Phase-lock loops are used for the frequency synthesizers that tune many radio and television sets and cellular telephones. So, yeah, it's a good way if you need to... Uh, to vary a frequency, you know, that's going to be pretty much a, a tuned circuit, so you're working with either inductor or capacitor or both. If you can use a voltage to vary a capacitance, you can vary the frequency. So they're handy devices. I don't recall ever have built anything with one, but uh, certainly in this shack alone right here, no telling how many Varactor diodes in these radios. Oh, yeah. What characteristic of a pin diode makes it useful as an RF switch? A, extremely high reverse breakdown voltage. B, ability to dissipate large amounts of power. C, reverse bias controls its forward voltage drop. Or D, low junction capacitance. What characteristic of a pin diode makes it useful as an RF switch? Hmm. Extremely high reverse breakdown voltage. That, that wouldn't really help. The ability to dissipate large amounts of power. No, you wouldn't want your RF switch dissipating your power. You'd want to pass it on through. Yeah. C, reverse bias controls its forward voltage drop. I don't think so. D, low junction capacitance. Well, that could be useful in an RF switch because you don't want any stray capacitance in there. Yeah, you know. that would have been my guess is D. Yeah. So I'm going to go with D. Chat room, they're saying D. And it is. Low junction capacitance. <laughs> Interesting. Maybe we should talk a little bit about pin diodes. 
Did you happen to study up on that last night? Well, I did. I that did. was handy. It was good timing, too. Yeah. A, pe <laughs> a pen diode is a diode with wide, undoped, intrinsic semiconductor regions between a P-type semiconductor and an N-type semiconductor region. The P-type and N-type regions are typically heavily doped because they are used for <laughs> omatic contacts. See, we didn't even know this stuff back in the 70s. No? No. A, a wide intrinsic... Am I saying that right? Intrinsic. A wide intrinsic region is in contrast to the ordinary PN diode. The wide intrinsic region makes the PN diode an inferior rectifier. One typical function of a diode. Hmm. But it makes it suitable for attenuators, fast switches, photo detectors, and high-voltage power electronics applications. Under zero or reversed bias, the off-state, a pin diode has a low capacitance. The low capacitance will not pass much of the RF signal. Under a forward bias of 1 milliamps, the on-state, a typical pin diode will have an RF resistance of about 1 ohm, making it a good conductor of RF. Consequently, the pin diode makes a good RF switch. Hmm. And they're used a lot, like, um, like in our transceivers when they switch between transmit and receive. Rather than using a relay, you know, modern transceivers will have a pin diode circuit in there. What about, what about this guy right here? That's an ant diode. How'd he get up there? <laughs> That's a good question, but I just want you to like swallow him while you were uh... He's licking his chops. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, on that note, seems to me like it would be a good time. <laughs> 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 Maybe it's a good time to uh, take a quick break. <laughs> I get the chocolate out and dip this in. in it. <laughs> uh, we'll be right back. Don't go away. Spring is on the air. Get outside with ICOM's ID52A, the industry's first handheld that can send photos over the D-Star network. With the ID52A, you can call your friends in another city or internationally through D-Star repeaters with clear digital audio. ICOM's newest handheld amateur radio is a VHF-UHF dual bander with D-Star and FM dual mode functions. This radio supports conventional FM communications and D-Star simplex, repeater, regional, and worldwide calls over the D-Star internet gateway. The ID52A is the first amateur radio with a full 2.3-inch waterfall display and can send photos over D-Star with the connected Android app. Other features include wideband receive with a guaranteed range of 144 to 148 and 440 to 450 megahertz. VHF, VHF, UHF, UHF, VHF, UHF with dual DV mode. Integrated GPS GLONASS receiver including grid square location, micro SD card slot, micro USB for data transfer, programming, or charge, and it meets IPX7 waterproof standards. Learn more about this and all the great ICOM radios at icomamerica.com slash amateur. What do you say we give away something? How about the shirt off my back? Mm. Or one like it? What One like it. I like that okay. better. Okay. So, if you wanted to win Tommy's shirt, well, there's a good way that you could do it. One like it. One like it, yes. Uh, send an email to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv, and I don't know, you got to have a name and you got to have an email address. That's it. That's it. You uh, want to write a comment or something in there? That's cool, but yeah. you don't have to. Or you cannot write a comment. That's like, cool, uh, too. Like this month's winner. Although he does write comments to us he does. from time to time. Who but might that be? Uh, well, 
This month's lucky winner of an ICOM swag package is Elliot Eckerd, oh. K1MF. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we know Elliot. He's been watching the shows for a long time. Yeah. So, Elliot, now you will be one of the best-dressed hams watching Ham College or turn around and look in the other way. Or, yeah, or yeah. put your back to the TV. <laughs> there you go. Well, congratulations, Elliot, and now's a good time to send in your entry. Just send an email to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv. You can give us a little bit of info in there if you want to, or you can just say hi or enter me in the contest. So, congratulations, Elliot. That's cool. Now, I think we got more questions here tonight. Not oh. a lot of them. There were only 11 questions on diodes yeah i noticed that Direction. i almost uh almost emailed you asked if that was a mistake because usually there's 12 which of the following is a common use of a schottky diode <laughs> a hmm. as a rectifier and high current power supplies b as a variable capacitance in an automatic frequency control circuit c as a constant voltage reference in a power supply or D, as a VHF, UHF mixer or detector. All right. Which of the following is a common use of a shot key diode? I'm going with D because I know better, but I think I probably would have guessed. You know, amazingly, everyone in the chat room is saying it's D as well. Yeah, but I almost, I, I might have picked B. Yeah. After the previous lesson. Except it's not a very active diode. It's a shot key. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But you're going with D. You said I'm going D. with D. Something in my gut just tells me D's the right answer. I don't know how you, you just ever gotta pull go, that out. You just got to go with the feeling, man. Yeah. What's the failure mechanism when a junction diode fails to excessive current a excessive inverse inverse voltage b excessive junction temperature c insufficient forward voltage r d charge carrier depletion what is a failure mechanism when a junction diode fails due to excessive current that's I think this one's pretty easy. It's going to be like the same kind of failure mechanism most components would have. When the smoke comes to, out of yeah, it? Yeah, excessive current. I'm just going to go straight for the throat on this one. I'm going to say it's B, excessive junction temperature. When you let the smoke out. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the smoke coming out is usually a function of the heat. Uh-huh. That so being dissipated. Thinking, when we were going down through that, I saw all I could think about was the heat, the uh, smoke came yep. out. And if you've ever watched a diode crack in real time, you don't want to put your finger on it. It's, uh, yeah. it's pretty warm. So, yeah, I'm going to go with B. Chad Room, what are they? They're all saying it's B over uh -huh. there. So, there you go. Excessive junction temperature. Will re-smoke take that, fix that? No, it won't. Re-smoke doesn't even work on that, huh? No, because it's got a crack in it then. It's all leaked out. You might could use some uh, some Flex Seal. Some Squishium? Some Squishium, something like that. But it'd probably be cheaper just to buy another diode. Probably so. Yeah. Which of the following is a Schottky barrier diode. A, a metal semiconductor junction. B, electrolytic rectifier. C, a pin junction. Or D, thermonic emission diode. I'm going to scratch off D and B. I don't think those are relevant. Pin following is a shot key barrier diode. 
I'm going with A. A. Hey. Yeah, because I don't think it's going to be. I don't. It's not B or D. I'm pretty sure, and I don't think it's going to be C because there is a pin diode. So I think it's got to be A. Okay. Well, let's see. Yeah, most of them are saying A in the chat room. Not all the answers, but it is a a metal semiconductor junction. And you know, we were um, that was actually in the splining earlier mm -hmm. when we were talking about a Schottky diode and what what would be an example of it. You remember the early crystal radios that had the cat whiskers in there? Mm -hmm. That's a cat whisker in the background there, that little piece of uh, metal whisker going down. How did the cat feel about that? Um, I don't know. He said the reception was pretty good. <laughs> Probably he didn't like giving yeah. it up. That's touching a piece of Galena crystal. And the early crystal radios, that's, that's what they used as the detector for the radio signal. Was that arrangement right there? Uh, so uh, that's what we'd call a cat whisker, or you could call that a metal semiconductor junction diode, or a point contact. That would be another name for it. You know, that might be a fun project to build a crystal radio from scratch. Yeah, I've. Um, I know I've you did done the MFJ that, yeah. kit. I built one from scratch when my son was young. It worked pretty well because uh, the 5 kilowatt AM tower was only, I don't know, 600 feet away. Yeah. So we had good reception. You probably got that on the TV, on the microwave, every, everywhere. Pretty much. I made one out of one of the old Radio Shack kits one time when I was a kid. I listened to that thing so much. Yeah. I never got one to work as a kid. I lived too far away, I guess, from the radio stations. It didn't do something right, but I oh, tried. Mine was a kit, so it was yeah. kind of hard to mess it up. Mine was too, but some, <laughs> well, one of them was. One of them wasn't. What is a common use for point contact diodes? A, as a constant current source. B, as a constant voltage source. C, as an RF detector? Or D, as a high voltage rectifier. What's a common use for a point contact diode? Well, you know, uh, a point contact diode, uh, that's uh, a cat whisker is a point contact diode. Uh, it says an RF detector. Hmm. That's going to be my answer. The chat room, they're all getting that one right, too. So it is. It must be right. Yep. And if you want to pet the kitty one more time. Deja vu. He wants he his whisker right back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and figure E6-2, what is the schematic symbol for a light-emitting diode? So, which is a light-emitting diode? I believe that's going to be... So, pick a number, and then we'll match it up with the letter. Well, I think it's five. Okay, so it's B. It's B. Yeah. Everyone <laughs> in the chat room uh, pretty much said five. Uh, what is number one? That's a good question. Well, let's see if you got it right first. And it is. It's number five. So, uh, what was number one? Anybody that's got an Arduino probably knows that one. Yeah. I'm, like everybody does Arduino blinking light first. I'm not sure if number one is really uh, anything. I don't recall ever seeing that before. Only one question left tonight. Okay. So, I'll take a hit. All right. What is used to control the attenuation of RF signals by a pin? Diode. A, forward DC bias current. B, the subharmonic pump signal. C, reverse voltage larger than the RF signal. Or D, capacitance of an RF coupled capacitor. I'm glad you got this one. 
What is used to control the attenuation of RF signals <clears throat> by a pen diode? Okay. Well, I remember we talked about a pen diode being used as uh, an RF switch or attenuator. Subharmonic pump signal. That's not it. Reverse voltage larger than the RF signal. No. Capacitance of an RF coupling capacitor. No. I'm going to say it's uh, A, the forward DC bias current. Yeah, that's what the other ones that have answered said. Yeah. Not too many answers in there. Now they're starting to come in. Okay. A. And it is. For DC bias current. Uh, we actually talked about that earlier, and seems like when you got up... Um, I get the ant out of the way here that's on the paper now. The dead ant. The dead ant. When we've got a forward bias of one milliamp, we've got an RF resistance of about one ohm. If we drop that down, the resistance is going to go up. Interesting. So, huh. it is a... Well, that's all the questions tonight. Um, well, Richard's saying, okay... I would have gotten two buzzers tonight. It happens. Oh, we had two last episode, didn't we? Yeah. I think that was the last one. I believe so. Those last ones were really hard. I mean, yeah. these, I, I don't know some of these, but I was able to reason some of them out, at least what I thought I was reasoning out. Yeah. Um, what do you say we... We just take a quick break and come back and visit with the chat room a few minutes. Sounds good. Around the 15th of each month, it's Amateur Radio's original and longest running video podcast, AmateurLogic.tv, with hosts George Thomas, Tommy Martin, Emil Diodene, and Mike Morneau. Roughly, here's what I have. The bottom trace here is ground. While the elements will jiggle some, they're actually not too bad. It's light. After putting it together, I decided to test everything, so I ran in 12 volts, and I'm measuring the output here. No, it's not too windy right now, Jim. It was yesterday. We're in the antenna switching matrix. Any one of our six broadcast transmitters could be connected to any of the 22 antennas. I personally am so thrilled that... George got the special award. Well deserved, my friend. That's really cool. Yeah, what about the Super Bowl, Emil? Did you go to the Super Bowl, or were you at home uh, operating that night? Tuning my amplifier, and oh, I lost power in the shack, and uh, went outside. The house lost power. <laughs> the whole neighborhood went out for about 30 minutes. I, I don't know what happened. Oh, huh. that explains a lot. And we can take this and put it over inside our box. It's flush to the bottom. If we were to rotate, we can see that thing goes all the way through. So we'll have a hole in the bottom. What ammunition do you use in there? Uh, actually, you can use black powder. You can use um, <laughs> WD-40. You can use, you know, anything combustible. Um, you just have to use the right quantity. And uh, we assume no responsibility for mishaps. <laughs> Here's what it looks like after I've got them all soldered together and the heat shrinked up. Okay, let's give it a try and see how it worked out. So there you have it, the hula loop. No, you can't null out the dogs barking. I have two thin film solar cells to run this. Looks like a little mini weather satellite, actually. And uh, I'm using a guitar string for the antennas. I particularly like that last one there, $29.99. You can get a 50-foot garden hose extension cord combo. <laughs> 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 Do not get cord wet. Now, most of these J-poles are built with metal elements or tubing. Uh, the reason I chose wire for this one is the length of this particular one. So I wanted to hang it from the tree so I can hoist it up there. Yeah. Go fishing. Well, we, we couldn't find the reel. <laughs> yeah. Is that what yeah. that is? All right, Tommy, sing the theme song here. Want me sing it now? Go ahead. Yeah, you don't want me to sing it now. <laughs> Nobody wants me to sing it. I think they'd rather me sell the shirt off my back than to start singing. 
Uh, John KC7DRI said that on those uh, diode symbols we were looking at earlier, he believes number one, according to a chart he pulled up, is a voltage variable capacitor. Let's go back and look at that. You know, I could see that. Maybe that's what that would mean. Uh, so what else is going on there? When making a crystal set, it seems like I used a germanium diode, as I remember is what Clay is saying. Yeah, I, I've i uh, used a germanium diode when making them before. You, you're either probably going to use a cat whisker or germanium diode or a piece of lead and a blue razor blade. If you can find a razor blade anymore. Uh, you can use the single ed razors that that you buy like at Lowe's. Oh, you know, okay. do you remember that? I did a segment on that. Uh, well, it was on Ham Nation years ago. Uh, I'm probably I may have missed that one. I built that MFJ uh, crystal radio kit, and it had a germanium diode. And I got to thinking about the uh, the razor blade and the lead. And I, I did some research online, and I found out you can take one of those razor blades and don't hold it with your fingers. Yeah. Heat it up real hot with a torch, and it'll blue it. Oh, uh, yeah? Yeah. I, and it worked. Uh, I've used that to blue some steel parts before. Basically, you heat it up till it's red, and you dunk it in an oil, mm -hmm. like canola oil or vegetable oil or something like that, and it blues it. When I made a table... I needed some darker bolts for it, and I actually blued the bolts for it. So huh. it's, it works really well. Yeah. Joe says decades ago, Radio Shack used to sell a crystal radio kit, and that's what I that's what I was saying earlier. I had I put that thing together. And I used to lay in my bed with that one little earbud, remember it like it was yesterday, and listen to that thing. I listened to it so much. Richard says he misses Radio Shack and carried. Actual electronics kits and books, and they did for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my wife has got to where she likes to watch uh, Young Sheldon. You ever seen that? Uh, I'm probably it, only it, once. It's twice. actually really funny, but uh, he's like really into Radio Shack stuff on there. He got he gets Radio Shack stock. It's really funny. He talks about Radio Shack all the time. Huh. I used to go in the radio shack, and I've said this before, but I'll I'll say it again. I used to just go in when all the components were hanging on the pegboards on the wall out flat. Not when they had those dividers where they were putting components on both sides of them. Uh -huh. That if that was the where it started to go downhill. For uh -huh. me. It's when they had them all out on pegboards on the wall. I'd go in there and spend hours just looking at every part they had and thinking what what can I build with that? And I bought I bought a lot of chips out of there mm -hmm. and built a lot of things. You know, I still got I found it the other day. You remember the little uh little eight bit uh recorder chip? Yeah. I s I've got that thing. It's actually still in the pack. I bought that had big plans for it and I never did even open it up. Still in the little plastic sealed up container. I think I've probably got one of those, too, and I can't remember if I ever used it or not. I've used some other brands, but I can't remember if I used one at Radio Shack sold or not. Some of those chips you cannot get anymore. You know, they don't make them. They didn't make those then. Most uh -huh. of them were Texas Instruments or, uh, or Analog Devices or some other brand. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's cool stuff, yeah. man. Just that was as, a good old time. Yeah. Some of the old Radio Shack kits have resurfaced under Vintage Science Fair brand. Huh. Yeah, they, they did call them Science Fair. Terry oh. says Radio Shack uh, stuff used to be sold all over here by a company called Tandy. Yeah, uh, they owned, yeah, that's Tandy the owned company. Radio Shack during that time period. They closed and Maplin arrived on the scene selling similar stuff. Now they're gone, too. Unfortunately, I think that's gone everywhere. Any final thoughts before we get out of here tonight? 
Mm, nope, I have no thoughts at all. None at all. <laughs> no, I'm, uh... I got one for you. Okay. What if we did give away the shirt off your back? What's for sale? I'm just kidding. <laughs> So what would you wear? Well, I'll, I'd probably go to, to the uh, swag shop there and get myself one of the Amateur Logic Ham College shirts. I'd go, I'd fire up my computer and go straight to shop.spreadshirt.com forward slash Amateur Logic. Pick myself something really nice. Might, might even get something for one of my friends or family members, too. Yeah, you might even get a coffee cup. That's a good idea. That's a multi-purpose coffee cup there. Well, this one is, but the ones they got now aren't. I think, yeah, they quit carrying that. I'm yeah. not sure why. Yeah, only one one logo on the new one. So, I don't know. Do we have both in there? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, cool. there's actually coffee cups. There's uh, insulated mugs, water bottles, uh, metal cups, backpacks, all kind of stuff. I've had a lot of things in there. Cool. So on Tuesday nights, if you're sitting around and you've got all these radios there and digital modes capabilities that you never have used. Hey, I know where you can tr try every single one of them out, except HF. You could go to our Amateur Logic Soundcheck net. I say ours. It's not really our net. This is net we, we kind of put together, but it's for everybody. It's for the community, the ham community. And... Uh, Kind of started it up when the COVID stuff started, and it's just been going and going. And uh, two more weeks, we will have had it. It'll be the two-year anniversary. Wow. Um, but it's it's a lot of fun. Everybody that checks in on it enjoys it. Uh, you can Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Central or 1 UTC, and uh, you can see there are a lot of different ways to connect. Um can try different modes. We've got Echolink, D-Star. DMR, M17, everything, pretty much. So try out all your stuff. Yeah. We usually have a question and uh, get some uh, really interesting and creative answers to some of them. It's a lot of fun. You don't have to answer the question if you don't want to, but you'll probably want to yeah. if you check in. So I'm pretty sure you'll have a good time if you check it out. And during the month, you can catch up with what's going on at the uh, at the Ham College Fraternities, that would be like, uh, oh, facebook.com slash group slash Ham College. Yeah, we're on uh, Twitter at Ham College. Uh, MeWe.com slash join slash Ham College for the MeWe group. Yeah, and we're also on Groups.io, groups.io slash G slash Amateur Logic. So join us at any of those places, and you can get the show notes. At our wiki, and that's amateurlogic.tv slash wiki. Well, thanks for being here tonight, everyone. We uh, we hope you've uh, you've learned a few things about diodes, because that's all we've got to say about them. It was plenty. It was plenty, but there's a lot more. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. Uh, but that won't be on your test, so you only have to worry about these But things. I can say I learned some things about di diodes that I really did not know before I came in here. Yeah. So it's it's. Interesting stuff. Diodes I don't think good. I've caught myself saying interesting more than once, but I meant it. Doubly interesting. Yep. Okay. Well, have a good uh, a good month till next time around. We we'll yeah. look forward to seeing you then. See you then. Hopefully, we'll see some of you or most of you in uh, on Amateur Logic in a couple weeks. Uh, let's see. The next Amateur Logic will be. April Just the rough. 15th is Good Friday, so... Is it... Oh, it is. It'll either be the 8th or the 15th or the 22nd. Something so, like that. Yeah. Stay tuned to the social media places we just mentioned. Yep. And join us at the end of April for the next time college. All right. 7-3, everyone. 7-3, everybody.
Tonight has been the April Fool's edition of Ham College. Yeah, none of these questions were real. No, they all were real. Just kidding. (laughs) 